So, um, question, how often does it rain here, like at this time of the year? It doesn't rain. <laughs> it doesn't rain. No. So this is highly unusual, right? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to show the people that are on Facebook because um, I believe this is exactly what the Lord is wanting to have happen, is to show the unusual tonight. So I'm going to show right here, people, on Facebook. You can see it's raining, and it like never rains. Only God. Isn't that awesome? How beautiful that it is. So cool. I see a lot of unusual things that happen when I... <laughs> In fact, I, I don't know, I'm going to ask you guys. So when you guys came uh, tonight, did you have any interference? Did you have any some, some kind of challenges? Maybe the enemy trying to delay yourself? Or was this day kind of harder maybe than a normal day? Anyone? Anyone? Was it? Was it? No. No? I know that a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, the enemy tried everything he could to not, or are striving or arguing or people that did certain things. So. I had a disappointment actually tonight. You what? I had a disappointment. You had, okay. All right. A little longer than her. All right. And yeah. I still haven't taken care of it. Okay. I'm still waiting to hear it. All right. All right. So, um, what the Lord's been doing is having me share my testimony, and then as I share my testimony, that helps to speak to everyone, and again, it's, uh, Holy Spirit is the one that does all this stuff, I just am a conduit to speak whatever I hear the Lord telling me to, to say, so, so uh, essentially, I grew up on a farm in Indiana, 160 acre farm, we had pigs, we had cattle, I was in 4-H, if you're familiar with 4-H, and I was in FFA, Future Farmers of America, even though I had no desire to be a future farmer, I wanted to get off the farm and make more money, and so, um, I had a good dad and a good mom when I grew up, which in the majority of people's lives, they had a father or a mother that wounded them in some capacity, and it could be because they were controlled more than what they should have been, or they were criticized, they weren't loved the way that they should be, and oftentimes we see that passed on from generation to generation, to where it might have gone back for a thousand years, you know, because we don't know our great-great-great-grandparents, how they were treated, or what happened in their lives, and so... Um, so when I grew up, I was fortunate I had a good dad and a good mom that loved me, but they did argue. There was a lot of arguments between they um, strove a lot or strive, um, had a lot of arguments. Um, my dad was really not the spiritual leader that he should have been. My mom wanted him to be more of that, but wasn't really in him because his dad was not a spiritual leader. So it was hard for me to pick up to become a spiritual leader as well. And um, when I was... Uh, 13 years of age, my grandmother came and prayed for me to receive my prayer language, which I received. 
but she was weird. <laughs> she was not normal. She was not, she was controlling. And so like my mom, all the time we'd get together for like the holidays and I'd look forward because we had a nice house, they had more money than we did. But we had to do everything just what grandma wanted to because if we didn't, then she would be upset. And she would say stuff to my mom or say stuff to my, my dad, but mainly her, her daughter. And uh, so it was like we were having to walk on eggshells whenever we were around them visiting. We just couldn't be ourselves and just have fun. And I didn't know why. My mom didn't know why. That was just the way she was. And she used to be really good friends with the pastor of the church. Then they had a break. And nobody knows what happened. Well, I know what happened now. I know that she was trying to control and manipulate and wanting her way. And the pastor finally said, enough of this. I'm not going to have it anymore. So they didn't have a relationship after that. And they actually didn't like go to church anymore after that either. I mean, occasionally they would go to different places, but they wouldn't go to a regular ch church. And then she kind of ruled the roost. She was like five foot tall. My uh, grandpa was like six foot three, 250 pounds. He was in World War II. Um, he was funny, and, and he was like a great grandpa. I loved him. Um, he had the, the grip of death, though, on my knee. He would like grab it, and it would be like tickling me. I'm like, will you stop that? That's awful. You know? But whatever grandma said, we had to do. So oftentimes, like, he wanted to eat at, um, like, a Fannie Mae candy store, and she would not let him do that. So if she ever caught him eating there, he would get lectured. He would get, you know, yelled at by her. So I remember once my brother was visiting the, the candy store, Fannie Mae, and then he saw Grandpa there, and Grandpa was like, don't tell Grandma, don't tell Grandma. And I'm like, really? I'm like, what is going on with that family behind closed doors? Because... Oftentimes we don't see the stuff that goes on behind closed doors. So, and if we do have stuff, we don't normally talk about it. It's all kind of kept hidden, and, and in secrecy is how the enemy gets to operate. When we we don't want to expose obviously everything like on Facebook Live for the world, but um, we do need to have some discussion. But there is health though when we actually can talk about certain things that are taboo that we don't normally that are that are kept hush hush, because when we share some things, we're able to actually have freedom actually have truth and stuff. So so ultimately, I end up going to Purdue University. It's a Big Ten school. Um, has a lot of quarterbacks there in the NFL, like Drew Brees um, went to Purdue, and uh, Bob Greasy, and uh, they had the first man on the moon that went to Purdue, um, Neil Armstrong. So I went to Purdue. I met a girl there who worked at an Assemblies of God church that she was a secretary there. I fell in love with her. We got married. and. And I know that she had a father that was pretty gruff and crit critical, criticized a lot. And um, being around him just wasn't real loving. You know, he wasn't a real friendly, loving guy. And uh, I got along with him as long as I just said and agreed with everything he said, basically. If he said something he didn't like, then he probably would be mad about it and wouldn't be you know, happy with you. So ultimately, um, I... Uh, got married to her, and we had three children, two sons and a daughter. My oldest son, when he was eight years old, in our neighborhood, a boy did something to him. We don't know exactly what it was, but it changed his life forever, changed my life forever, and uh, it caused him to do things that a boy eight years old shouldn't be doing. I try and keep it discreet, um, but uh, it really affected his life dramatically, and affected our life dramatically. Um, we ended up having to put him into counseling, hoping that would fix what had gone on, the trauma in his life, but it did not. They said that he had ADHD, which is, I think everybody in the world now has ADHD now. <laughs> and he had ODD, they said oppositional defiance disorder, which, which just means like if you tell him to do this, he would say no. He would be disrespectful, and I'm like, I would never do that to my dad, you know, or my mom. I would get spanked really <laughs> badly if I did. But yet, it was like he was a different person that I couldn't control anymore. He wasn't the nice, loving kid anymore. He had changed. And so it went from bad to worse, and it just wore and wore on our family. Whenever he would come home from the school bus, my stomach would get sick because I knew the peace would end as soon as he walked through the door, and he did. He would come in, he would start picking on his brother and his sister, and then would be disrespectful to me and his mom, and it's like, I can't fix this. I'm like, I'm a fix-it kind of guy. Why can't I fix this? And the counseling wasn't doing anything, the drugs weren't doing anything. And so it went on and on and on, and it wore and wore in our, our marriage, and then eventually my wife decided to file for divorce. I didn't want that. I tried to stop it as much as I could. I delayed as long as I could. I said, it's not right. I didn't believe in that at all, but 
I couldn't stop it. And so it went through in June of 2008. And it was very sad for me because I'm like, I didn't want to ever work a divorce. That just was devastating to me. And so I'm like, uh, the Lord, though, at that point started to speak to me. He's like, okay, Nelson, what is it that you want out of your life? And I'm like, well, I thought it was money. If I had enough money, I wouldn't have any problems. But I go, I don't have any peace. I go, what I'd really like to have is peace. If you can give me peace, then uh, peace and money, I would like that a lot. You know? but <laughs> if I had to choose, I will choose peace and not have money, uh, thinking there's no way I'm going to lose the money because I had about a half million dollars saved up. So he said, good choice. I will give you peace. I will take away all the money that you have. It will be gone. And you will have to trust in me. I will change your heart in the process. And you will have my heart at the end of this. And then he said, I can bring the money back way greater than it was before because now you'll have my heart and I can trust you with money because you'll use it for kingdom purposes, for helping people around the world versus just yourself. So I agreed to that thinking there's no way I'm going to lose half a million dollars. And Well, through the divorce, it took about 55% of my money away like that. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I'm like, okay, well, I'm tight with my money. I don't waste it, so I'm not going to lose the rest of this. Well, then... He's, he, within, and that was in June of 2008 that it was final. Within about a couple months, the Lord said, okay, now you're ready to look for your next wife. And I'm like, what? No, I want my original wife back. He's like, no, that's not the plan. I'm like, what do you mean that's not the plan? Yes, it is. I go, I want my original wife back. He's like, no. He goes, there's another one that I want you to marry. And I'm like, what? Who? I'm like, how do I find her? You know, I'm like, this is weird. I go, I don't want to date anybody. I want to just remarry. And the Lord said, it's not going to happen that way. And I'm like, all right. So then I'm like, well, how do I find? And what he ended up doing is he ended up bringing a woman to me. She invites me to go to a Christian conference. Ben, uh, 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 Morris Cirillo was the name of the guy. I don't know if anybody's heard of, heard of <coughs> Morris Cirillo. Yep. He's like 87 probably now. Very anointed, this woman that the Lord brought to me said. He was very anointed, and I really didn't know what anointed meant. I'm like, what did he do? Pour oil on his head every day? You know, <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. So I'm like... Okay, I'm game. I will go to the conference with you, but who else is going to be there that I might know? And she said, Benny Hinn's going to be there. John Hagee's going to be there from Cornerstone in San Antonio. I knew them. Uh, she said, Miles Monroe, which I did not know. Oh, yeah. Uh, he's great. And then, unfortunately, he passed away. But um, uh, Reinhard Bonnke. Mm -hmm. um, who else? Mike Murdoch was from Dallas. Um, Cindy Murdoch, his sister, I think. She's a singer. Um, our sister-in-law, maybe. And then B.B. and C.C. Winans were singers. They were there. Britt Nicole was an up-and-coming singing, singer from Nashville. It was in Nashville, Tennessee. So we go there. It was about 4,000 people from around the world. For those of you that don't know Morris Cirillo, he lives in San Diego. He used to be a, an orphan in uh, New Jersey. He was going to kill himself. And the Lord spoke to him and said, if you don't kill yourself, you'll save the lives of millions of people around the world. So that's essentially what he's done. He's very anointed, and he has crusades of maybe sometimes a quarter million people that show up, so a lot. He's very anointed. So we go to, go to the conference, and everything in my life changed from that point forward. Up to that point, I really didn't, couldn't say I heard from the Lord. You know, I didn't even think really it was possible. I mean, I tried to do good as much as I could. I failed, you know, like a lot of us. Um, but when I go there, first night, I'm sitting like two-thirds of the way back, I'm putting my hands up because the first song is coming on, like I normally put my hands up to praise the Lord and sing. Well, then all of a sudden my hands start to like do this and start to like shake a little bit. And I'm like, what? What the heck? Why are my hands shaking, you know? And I couldn't stop it. I'm like, well, this is kind of cool. Never had that happen before, you know? Well, then this girl that invited me to come is like, hey, your hands are shaking. I'm like, oh, I know. I go, I don't know why. They've never done this before. I go, maybe it's the anointing you talk about. Maybe that's what it is, you know? And so, for like the whole time we worship, they were like doing that, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's so weird. I'm like, I hope they stop when we're done singing, you know? And they did, I'm like, oh, thank you God, because I want to be normal, you know? <laughs> and so then, the next day, they ask us to serve at this book table for Boris Cirillo. So we're serving there, and people are coming up to us, assuming that we're married. And I'm like, what? We're not married. I go, I don't even know who she is yet. I go, I'm just, I met her two weeks ago, you know? I don't know what she is to me, and so, that night, they invite us to sit in the second row, in the front and center, out of 4,000 people. And I'm thinking in my mind, what the heck, Lord? <laughs> I'm not supposed to sit there. I don't even know, I don't even know if I like Morris, you know? He's kind of weird, you know? He's got a weird <laughs> voice, you know? You've got to be honest, Lord. And so I get up there and sit, and the Lord's like, this is exactly where I want you to be. I'm like, okay, why is that? You know, he doesn't say anything else. And then, and then this 
girl that brought me. He's like, we need to run to the front because it's really noisy up front at the end of the service. So I'm like, run? I don't have to run. I go, we're ahead of like 99% of the people. I'm like, 99% of them are older than we are. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure I could like take baby steps and beat them. You know? So at the end of that service, she like pushes me out of the room or the row and we go up to the front. And it's like Morris is like where you are standing like 10 feet away on top of the platform. And I'm here behind this girl that I j just met two weeks before. And then I hear the Lord really clearly speak to me. He said, you were going to love her like Christ loved the church. I was like, what? Who can do that, you know? That's supposed to be like a suggestion by Paul. You know, I don't know that anybody ever does that. We're supposed to aspire to that, you know? But so at that point, I go, I'm like, I guess how I'm going to have to do that is we're going to get married then. I'm like, that was fast. I'm like, just like, wow, two weeks, I found my wife. I'm like, well, that's crazy, Lord. Well, then we have these prophetic words spoken over us by all these prophetic people that I had never had a prophetic word spoken. I always wanted one because I'm... First of all, I want to see if it's real, you know. And second of all, I want to see what they might hear, because I really didn't hear up to that point. So the first guy had prophesied over both of us and said that you guys are going to have a ministry together. You're going to flow in the gifts of prophecies and words of knowledge and healings and deliverance, which I didn't do any of that. All I did is pray in my prayer language. And so I'm like, well, I'll, I'll take that with a grain of salt, you know. I'm like, yeah. You probably say that to all the couples here, you know. <laughs> well, then the next person came up and prophesied the next day, and they're like the very same prophecy. Like, you guys are really anointed, you're going to be doing this all, all over the world. And I was like, what? What kind of ministry are we going to have? You know, they didn't tell us. They just said, it's going to be really blessed by the Lord. And we had a third person say the same thing. Well, by the time you hear it the third time, you're like, I think they're onto something. I think God's not making this up. I don't think they're collaborating with each other. You know, it's like, let's play a trick on this couple and just tell them the same word, you know. So they didn't know each other, and they didn't know us. So by the end of that conference, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, that's where the Lord wants me to, to, to choose for my wife. And so I'm like, awesome. So we ended up getting married, and on our wedding night, I saw a different side of her. <laughs> that was not the same as when we dated. And uh, I, I, I felt a lot of anger, a lot of pain, and it just came out instantly. And then the Lord then spoke to me, because I'm like, Lord, I'm like, you told me I'm going to love her like Christ of the church. It's supposed to be really good. And he's like, mm, well, you are going to love her like Christ of the church, but he said you're going to lay your life down for her in every way imaginable. She's got a lot of pain in her from her father wounds, her mother wounds, and the previous uh, marriages and stuff. So he said you're going to take out all the pain, or she's going to take out all the pain on you. He goes, you can't tell anybody about this, though. You have to keep it quiet. He said, until the end. He said, at the end, then it'll all be worth it. In the end, you'll have the ministry that everyone had prophesied over you. But he said, that's contingent upon you doing your part, and that is not telling anybody about what you're going to go through. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, how bad can it be? She's a girl, I'm a guy, you know. Well, it got pretty bad. <laughs> and, um, and, and it was interesting, three months into the marriage, we, were, we started getting mentored from a guy from California that started teaching us about our authority in Christ and how to pray differently, which I'd never heard of before. You know, he's like, how do you pray, Nelson? I'm like, well, like everybody else, please God, if it's your will, you know, pleading. And he's like, well, that's not a prayer of authority. He said, you need to pray like Jesus want, you know, taught the disciples to pray, and that is with authority. How do the disciples do what they did? He said, they prayed the same way that Jesus did. So he said, you need to learn to do the same thing. He goes, you need to take authority over your son. He said, your son has these spirits on him that have been tormenting him since what happened to him when he was eight for 10 years. He said, when you take authority of them and command them to go, they'll go, and you'll get your son back. I'm like, no, it can't be that easy. He's like, try it. I'm like, well, doesn't he have to want to be set free? He goes, oh, he wants to be. I'm like, no, he doesn't. He loves to make my life miserable. He's punched me. He's thrown milk on me. He's been awful. He's like, no, Nelson, those are the enemy spirits in him telling him to do that. That's not who he really is. Who he really is is like you. He's loving, kind, gentle, and sweet. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm a business guy, I'm a logical guy, so I will try this. I go, if it works, I will love you forever. I go, if it doesn't work, then no harm, no foul, I guess. So I tried it the next day. I asked him if I could pray for him. To my shock, he said yes. So I just put my hands on him. I said, I command any enemy spirits to be gone from you in Jesus' name, and I release peace over your mind. Amen. And then I kind of looked to see if I could see demons flying out. And I couldn't see them, so I'm like, did it work? I'm like, I don't know. So then the next day, I go out to mow the grass, which is something he hadn't done for two years and never willingly did it. He comes out of the house, and I stop the mower, brace myself for something mean, and instead he says, hey, Dad, can I finish mowing the grass for you? And I about fainted. I'm like, oh, my gosh, who is this? 
And they said, also, I want to go get a haircut and apply for a job at Burger King. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> this kid gotten fired from Kroger like a year before. And I'm like, uh, okay. So I give him the mower, I go in the house, I fall on the carpet, start crying. And I'm like, Lord, what happened? He said, you got your son back. I'm like, are you kidding me? I go, it's that easy? Why didn't you tell me 10 years ago? I would have saved myself a whole lot of H-E-double-L. And he said, well, because it's part of your ministry. You had to walk through that so you could experience what it was like firsthand. He goes, if it was just a year or less, it would have been a blip on your radar screen. But because it took 10 years, you know how those spirits operate. You'll have an authority now over those spirits, and you can teach other people about this. And you'll help others that have gone through the very same thing to know about this authority as well, because they can take it as well. So um, he changed. He changed instantly his behavior. Now, his physical form changed over about a year. And so I can show you the before and the after. So this is what he looked like before he got set free. And I just tell people, this is what it looks like when you are being tormented by those voices from the enemy. You can see he looks very dark and depressed and sad in the eyes. The Lord always told me that you can always see it. It's like the windows, the eyes of the windows to the soul. So you can see the hopelessness. And then, after he got delivered, he looked like that. Yeah, you can see the eyes are like blue eyes. And it looks oh, like my glory eyes. to God. Oh, that's wow. his kid? That's my kid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, well, that's his kid. Yeah, her, her name is Trinity. That's oh, her wow. name. Yeah. Oh, wow. Nice. Yes. Yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that was like a year later. Wow. Different. So, I, I was, I mean, because I, I was basically saying to myself, I'm like, he's either going to be in jail or dead by the time he's 20 because he would not listen to authority. He knew it all. He was disrespectful. So I got out. And uh, I was. You know, and I'm a, I'm a dad, I want to fix things. But like, like I couldn't fix that because it was a spiritual issue. Until finally this guy told me that, hey, we have an authority over our children. Normally it's when they're like in the home, if they're 18 and under, once they move out, then they have their own authority, their own free will. So we have to kind of, it's a little more challenging at that point, to put it that way. So when that happened, I'm like, okay, Lord, I want to do this the rest of my life because this is amazing. I go, I saw the change before my eyes just like that. He said, you will, you'll do it the rest of your life, and, and more than that. And so I'm like, okay. So then meanwhile, my wife kept getting worse, and then she would tell me that she could hear the enemy telling her bad things about me. So I kept trying to pray and rebuke the enemy on her, and it didn't work. And I'm like, why is it not working on her, but it worked on my son? So she kept getting worse and worse. She threw knives at me, glasses at me, she chased me. Um, but she would tell me what her dad had done, and her mom, and so I could oftentimes see in the spirit realm that what she was doing to me her dad had done to her like he would she told me he had to get in, in, her, in her face and would yell at her and she'd have to take it take it and take it and take it so then she would like run into a bedroom that i was like running away from her and she'd get in my face and yell at me and i could just tell that's her dad doing that to her now she's doing it to me and i couldn't understand why i'm like i'm a good guy i love you you know i'm loving you like christ of the church but yet it was part of my training is what i went through it for um, but it took six years of going through that, and I couldn't tell anybody about it, so it was awful. And um, I did love her like Christ at the church, you know, and I laid my life down. I took on $85,000 worth of debt from her two sons. I couldn't tell my kids why I couldn't take them out to eat anymore. I couldn't buy them clothes anymore because I was doing that for her, because you know, my kids would have hated her kids, her sons, and they would have hated her. So I kept it all quiet. Nobody knew but me and God. And then finally, after six years, she tried to stop me from doing ministry. We were starting to do a little bit of ministry, um, but she would get jealous of me, and she would try everything she could to like stop me. And she even told me I had to promise to no longer do ministry and to work on our marriage. <laughs> I'm like, well, wait a minute. If you could be fixed, I say we wouldn't have a problem with the marriage. But I'm like, something's wrong. I go, and you know it because you keep telling me you hear the enemy telling you bad things about me. So I'm like, I don't know how to fix that. I go, I wish I could do that, but I, I can't. I go, we could do ministry together like we're supposed to do. And so ultimately, the Lord said, um, on the, fi the final straw was when she told me I couldn't sleep in my own bed anymore. And there are times that I, I chose to like sleep in my car or sleep in the mulch in our neighborhood playground down the street because like I wanted peace. I didn't want to get yelled at for three hours because she would do that. And I'm like, it's just agonizing. And so after six years, he said, you need to separate from her. I'm like, I don't want to separate. I love her. I go, you told me we're going to do this ministry together. He said, I know. He said, and 
He goes, just keep trusting me on this. But he said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the ministry through you. And you have to be separate from her because the spirits in her hate you and want to basically kill you. I'm like, I know that already. Get her delivered, Lord. I go, why don't you get her delivered so we can do this together? He said, just trust me. So he said, when you separate, I will start to grow the ministry around the world. It will grow rapidly. And you'll start seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of people getting delivered from the very same stuff that she's going through and to a lesser degree. Because he said you had to go through kind of the subtle version of those spirits and the extreme version of those spirits. So you have an authority and you know when you're speaking to people about both, both ends of the spectrum. Because there's a whole lot of people, like billions of people out there that are striving in their marriages because of the very same thing that she's going through. And I'm like, all right. So I came home, I told her, I said, listen, I love you, but I have to separate. She's like, you'll never separate. I'm like, I go, I don't want to separate, I love you. I go, but there's something in you that hates me, and you can't stop it, and I don't know how to stop it. I go, and the Lord wants the ministry to start out of this, so I'm going to start it. And uh, I wish you would join me, but I said, you have to be nice and normal. You can't be this way anymore. And I didn't know what it was. He never told me the whole six years. So it was within two weeks after I separated. I wanted us to go to counseling and try to get it resolved so she could get fixed and stuff. But the counselor at the church, the pastor, she lied to about me, lied horribly. He bought into lies. He basically was like, get out of my church. And I'm like, what? I'm like, sit down and talk to me. He wouldn't even talk to me. Well, two weeks after I separated, our best, one of our mutual best friends, I explained, finally, what I went through, and then she knew exactly what was wrong. She said, my sister has the very same thing. Not to that extreme level, but she has the same thing that you're talking about. I know exactly what it is. I'm like, really? I've been waiting for six years. I'm like, please tell me. She goes, it's the spirit of Jezebel and the spirit of Leviathan. I'm like, well, I've heard of Jezebel. She's in First Kings and Second Kings. You know, not a very nice woman. Had killed the prophets and, uh, you know, uh, worshipped Baal and uh, was against God. And I said, Leviathan, what the heck is a Leviathan? I don't even know what the heck that is. And she's like, well, you need to read it. It's in Job 41. And so I'm like, okay, I will. And so I read Job 41. The whole thing describes Leviathan. And uh, the last two verses, I mean, the whole thing talks about, like, it's like an alligator. It's like a water spirit where it's got, a, like a, it's got teeth, like lots of teeth, like an alligator. It says it's got a long tail, it's got scales. So it's describing that, and it says the scales are its pride. And in verse, the last two verses, I will read it verbatim. So this is verse 33 and 34 of Job 41, explained everything with that spirit. Let me bring it up here. All righty, so Job... And I can honestly say I never read this in, in my life. And I never heard a pastor ever preach on this because I don't think they really understood it. So on verse 33 it says, On earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. So if we have any pride that's high that we shouldn't have, that is what we're dealing with is this spirit called Leviathan. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do some more research on this. So I did research on the internet, read some books. And um, these are the characteristics that are described with Jezebel, Leviathan, and then Ahab. Normally, wherever you have a Jezebel, they are oftentimes married to a person that has a stronger Ahab spirit. And uh, Ahab, King Ahab, if you remember, he, uh, he was the king, but uh, pretty much Jezebel ran the show because whatever she wanted, she got. And... Uh, and you remember the time where he wanted Naboth's vineyard that was right next door, and he couldn't get it? He shouldn't have had it because it was Naboth's. He shouldn't have passed it on down to his kids. So he ends up, like, crying in, in the bed about it, and then Jezebel says, What's, so why are you so sad? Well, I can't have Naboth's vineyard. She's like, okay, I'll take care of that. And then she frames Naboth and has him killed, and then takes away and steals that vineyard and gives it to Ahab. So it says in, in, in First Kings that he did more evil in the sight of the Lord than all the other kings prior. So what he did was evil is he forsook the Lord. He ended up choosing to marry a woman that was not godly whatsoever for political gain. So these are the characteristics of those spirits. And, and basically what it shows us is if we operate in this stuff, then we're probably hearing that voice of one of these spirits. And most of us are affected by all three to some degree because most of us did not have Jesus for our dad or our mom, which would be weird. So if we have any of this in us, in which I had all three of these, I had a strong, you normally have a stronger default though towards either a Jezebel or an Ahab. 
So if you are hearing the voices of this spirit called Jezebel, again, Jezebel is around, but spirit prior to Jezebel being here on earth. I mean, when all the, the, all the angels fell with Satan, you know, they operated in this, you know, people operated in this, they heard the voices. But, uh, so this is what, and they, they're like the strong men. When you get delivered from the strong men, all these other characteristics will go with it when you're complete, completely set free, when you take away the legal right of them to have a torment on you. So Jezebel causes us to be anxious and fearful. That's the kind of the core of it. We end up hearing that voice and it causes us to fear. Um, it causes us to be controlling, manipulative. So it wants to get its way. It's very demanding. It's jealous. Uh, normally there's a sexual impurity to it and selfishness. There's, they're very good at lying. And sometimes they don't even perceive it. They're just saying these things that are half-truths or aren't truths. And it causes them to say things to protect themselves, to make them blame other people and shift the blame. They oftentimes are very desiring to have power and leadership. And again, it goes for not just in the church, it goes into the school systems, it goes into politics, it goes into the you know, corporations, companies. Uh, you'll see this, you know, because if a person has that spirit, that's what it's going to draw them to do. Um, they ultimately want to tr shut down the true Holy Spirit from functioning. They like to dominate things. They like to intimidate. So they say things to make you get afraid so they can get their way. They act assured, but they're really very insecure inside. They cannot stand to be told no. They love to provoke people until they get angry, and then they blame them for it. So they'll say a lot of things to provoke them to get angry, and then all of a sudden the person can't take it anymore. They stand up. They're like, will you stop this? And, da, 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 da. and then they like point the finger back at them and say, look how bad that you are. And they're like, wait a minute. I didn't do this. I didn't start this. You did. Oh, no. So they won't take responsibility. Um, and they awful, off, um, will all, always have a lot of um, chatter in their mind from the enemy. So it's really hard for them to turn their brain off to rest. It's like they could be going to bed at night and they hear all these thoughts coming in. You know, a lot of people don't think about the thoughts they're having. I never did. I thought all my thoughts were my own thoughts. But there's a lot of thoughts I had that weren't. They were from the enemy, causing me to think things and trying to buy into what they were saying. And then I would operate and do and what they told me to do. Ahab, when you have an Ahab, again, most marriages, you have a person that has a stronger... I mean, it, there's different degrees of the Jezebel spirit. I'll explain how you get it. Um, same thing with the Ahab. But if you have an Ahab spirit, you don't like to confront people. Because you know if you confront them, there's going to be an argument to break out. So you better just let them alone and try to avoid the fight or the argument and let them get their way. Um, they have a strong desire to make everybody happy. They're afraid of being rejected. They oftentimes don't like to take responsibility for something because if they do and it goes bad, then they look bad. They um, will avoid telling people you know, what they should be told because they know that if they talk to them about something that they may get yelled at by them or get corrected, so they just let it go. Um, they believe it's their duty to try to make everybody happy and comfortable. Oftentimes they have a challenge making decisions. They um, will fear being abandoned. They uh, are, um, will do anything to gain acceptance. They're oftentimes a very nice person, but then they're too nice. They end up getting walked over like a mat. And then they also have a low self-esteem oftentimes. But you'll see oftentimes Ahabs can be like presidents of companies. They can be in jerks and they want to love everybody. But then oftentimes you'll have people that have the Jezebel spirit that will come in trying to get into leadership positions, trying to be in charge of, could be worship, could be intercessory, could be the healing rooms, you know, could be a lot of things, you know. And then this Leviathan spirit comes in, and again, again all three of these oftentimes are in our lives, but we have a default towards Jezebel or Ahab. Leviathan causes us to be prideful. So we don't want to admit that we're prideful. Nobody wants to, you know. I, I was prideful. You know, with, when I was married to my first wife, when I was married to my second wife, the Lord changed everything. He got me delivered. I didn't even ask for it, but he did it. And then I was a different person. You know, I, I was able to tolerate a lot more stuff, and I was more patient. But the Lord stripped me from the majority of the pride that I had at that point. But uh, it will twist the communication, too, in your mind. So if you are having a conversation with someone that has Leviathan, it will confuse and twist and twist the actual words. So what you're saying is, when someone's having a conversation with you, you may be hearing something entirely different, or it may change a few key words, and then you swear what you heard was the truth, when it really wasn't. So it confuses a lot of things. Um, 
And I've had one woman told me that her husband had it, and he, like, she would say, I'm going to go to the grocery store, and he heard, like, I'm going to go to the bar or something. And he's like, what? You shouldn't be doing that. You know, you could... And she's like, I didn't say that. I said, I'm going to the grocery store. It's like, no, you didn't. I swear, you said this. And that's what they hear, and that's what they believe. So oftentimes, when you're in a relationship with someone like that, you almost feel like you're going crazy. Because you're like, wait a minute, I know exactly what was stated. I didn't say that. And um, so it really confuses a lot. Also, I've seen people that have dyslexia suffer from Leviathan. Because um, the spirit will let, uh, um, wrap around a person's spine, and it twists. So oftentimes, they have back pain, back pain and neck pain. You know, I used to have the spirit. I used to have uh, scoliosis. And I used to go to the chiropractor. I used to have headaches all the time. Couldn't get them set free. Um, insomnia is another thing that you have. You don't sleep well at night. It tries to steal your dreams. It uh, causes you to be drowsy when you try to read the Bible or Christian books. You can't stay awake. It's like putting you to sleep. It will twist your neck and your, your uh, spine. Fibromyalgia, I see all the time. People have that Leviathan spirit. And... Um, and so then how do you get these spirits? Because everything I was reading in the books described my, my wife to a T and, and described me more too when I was uh, with my first wife. And so I'm like, well, how do you get these? Because all the books basically said it was really, really hard to get delivered from these. Like the people that have the stronger Jezebel spirits in Leviathan, they would lie their way out of like counseling appointments and so forth. They would say what the counselor wanted them to hear to get them on their side. And then the counselor didn't know who to believe, you know, because they're really, really good at convincing. So I'm like, well, how do you get this, though, Lord? Because if I'm going to get people delivered from this, I want to know how you get them delivered, sure, but I also want to know how they get it. And so this is what was really not in the books. And after he explained it to me, then I started validating it throughout the world, and I, I've seen it. So the Lord said, this is how you, how you primarily get it. How you primarily get it is you grow up with a father or a mother that hurt you. You know, and it could be something as subtle as they were busy working a lot. They didn't really mean intentionally to hurt you, but they just weren't around much. And when they were around, maybe they didn't show much affection to you. So you didn't feel loved. So you're having thoughts in your mind saying, I don't even know if my dad really loves me. You know, maybe the dad never even said I love you. Maybe he never hugged. You know, my dad didn't really hug uh, much. Occasionally he said, I think he loved, uh, loved me. But uh, most guys, most dads, that I know don't say that. They don't show much of an emotion. They just are more stoic and stuff. The women normally are more nurturing. And so if you grew up like that, especially if you were a girl and you grew up with a dad that was working a lot that didn't have much time for you, then you'll have thoughts saying, I don't know if my dad really loved me. Well, then you'll have thoughts of the enemy coming in and saying, yeah, your dad didn't love you. He didn't want you. You know, he wanted a boy instead. He treated you treated like a boy. And so you'll hear thoughts coming from the enemy that you think are your thoughts, and you'll buy into it. And as you grow older, you keep hearing those same thoughts. You don't know the difference. You know, it says in the Bible we're supposed to take every thought captive. But what if we don't recognize which thoughts are coming in from the enemy versus coming from ourselves? Is it still raining? Wow. It's so cool. I love unique, supernatural, cool stuff that God does. So, so anyway, um, when he told me that, and he said the same thing goes with guys. If guys have a father that were really harsh to them, that there's nothing they could do to earn the love of their father, that their dad might have said some things that were really hurtful, then they'll pick up the spirit as well. You know, because a lot of people think, well, the Jezebel spirit is just a woman thing. No, it's not. It's a guy thing. I've seen guys that have it, and they're just as bad, you know, to the women, you know, except they're stronger, you know. But, um, and I've seen women that get the Jezebel spirit because they had a, a mother that didn't love them the way they should, that they were hurt. You know, if you get hurt deeply, you know, if you have a person that uh, was a father or mother that was more than just saying words to hurt you, but maybe they were taking action. Maybe they were being more physically punishing you um, that were more on the lines of borderline abuse. Um, and there could be sexual abuse going on, all that stuff. The stronger and more impactful of the pain that we go through, then normally what you'll see is the stronger that those spirits will have on us. And then they will speak to us. And, uh, and the other way that you can get those spirits, Lord said, is through any type of sexual violations. Because if anybody gets touched inappropriately sexually, and it may be when you were a child, you don't even know it. Maybe when you were six months old, somebody did something to you. Maybe an uncle or an aunt or whomever. And you don't even know it. And then all of a sudden, you, you'll start to hear those voices and as you're growing up. You don't know what happened to you. Because I see that a lot, too. Um, there's one guy, he, had, uh, had a, he stayed over at his, his, uh, one of his best friend's house. He was a pastor of the church. His pastor's son was six. 
and so was he. He got touched inappropriately sexually at that overnight. He didn't tell anybody about it, which mainly happens. Uh, most times guys don't tell anybody. Women maybe tell, I don't know, half the time. You know, they're, or they're told, they're threatened that if you ever tell anybody, you know, I'll kill you or whatever. So they keep it a secret. You know, and then uh, that secret, unfortunately, being kept, allows the enemy then to keep tormenting them. You know, I've seen it thousands of times over the world. And so when the Lord shared that with me, I'm like, man, that makes a lot of sense. The other thing that I've learned, too, is if you had a father, grandfather, great-grandfather involved in Freemasons, Shriners, Eastern Star for the women, they do, if you're, if you're in it long enough, you make oaths, ultimately, to Satan. I mean, there's a guy that came out of it that I know. He actually went all the way to the 32nd degree, which is the highest mason you can be. Then he went into Shriners, and he came out of it. And he had all kinds of physical stuff all over his body. And he said, you know, he was explaining all the stuff that they did that was not godly at all. And I'm like, oh my gosh, the Lord showed me that. Yeah. He goes, you, Nelson, had a grandfather involved in Freemasons, and you didn't know it. I'm like, no, I didn't. But because of that, he said, that's why you had Leviathan come on you. It comes down the bloodline to the third and the fourth generations. Like it talks about in the Bible, the infirmities and the iniquities of the fathers will be visited upon the third and the fourth generations. So essentially the same torment that he invited in gave a legal right of the enemy to then come down to my dad, come down to me and my kids and my brothers. And so I had scoliosis. I had headaches and um, went to the chiropractor a bunch. It helped a little bit, but never fixed the problem. Um, and if you had a mother that was involved in the Eastern Star, it's the very same thing. It's all about money is what that organization's about. And uh, it's, um, it's sad. You know, a lot of them go to church, too. You know, you wouldn't know. They, they act really nice oftentimes. They don't act horrible, so you wouldn't ever guess that. But So after I learned all this, I'm like, okay, well, how do you get people delivered then? I go, I don't want people doing the weird stuff that I've seen on Hollywood. I go, I want to do it in a normal, calm, business-like fashion because I'm a business guy. And I really don't want to do this ministry anyway, I go, but if you're going to have me do it, let's do it in a normal way. And especially if I'm going to go into churches, I'm like, how am I going to get into churches? They're not going to, you know, if people do this weird stuff that the demons manifest. So I said, yeah, just take authority. He said, when you do those, command those spirits to not do any manifestations, and they won't. You have authority. You know, I give you that backing, and the Lord, of course, has the, the authority, but he'll grant that to his, you know, anybody that, you know, has, you know, desire, you know, to do that. So anyway, he said, take authority, shut it down. He said, and then when you take them through the prayers, he said, it's three parts to get delivered. He goes, the number one part is they have to choose to forgive all those that hurt them. He said, that can be hard for a lot of people because if they've been hurt deeply, that enemy's on their pain and saying, don't you ever, you know, look what they did to you. They were so horrible to you, your dad, your mom, your spouse, ex-spouse, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, teachers, policemen, whomever. And, and, that, and that thought from the enemy keeps coming in saying, you know, they were horrible to you. And you're like, yeah, yeah, they were, they were. So it develops a lot of anger, a lot of bitterness. Well, that gives the right of the enemy then to form in us, where we hear them in our minds. And so we don't have the peace that we could have because of that. Now, we may even verbalize it and say, I know I'm supposed to forgive, so I choose to forgive. But if that enemy knows your heart, that you still have the bitterness in there, even though you verbally said it, but you didn't mean it then the enemy will still have a right to be on us. And he'll continue to speak to us in our minds. And so I'm like, okay, well, how do I get them delivered then? Because you know, some of these people have been hurt way more. I mean, I didn't get really hurt. I go, but I know that my spouses have been hurt. And uh, so how do I do that? And he said, well, he goes, you know, share with them and have the Holy Spirit reveal to them why that person did to them what they did. Let the Holy Spirit reveal because in the Holy Spirit will, they'll show them, whoever it was that hurt them, why they did it. And he said, invariably it will come back to that they were hurt by someone, their dad, their mom, someone else. He said, and when they can see that, that they were hurt because of that, then it will help them to understand. There's a movie called The Shack. I don't know if you've seen The Shack yep. or not. So I didn't see it at first, there's a whole bunch of controversy, and I'm like, I was busy. And Lord finally said, you need to watch that. I'm like, I don't know. There's a lot of controversy for some reason. I don't know. So I ended up watching it, and then of course I understood why they did it the way they did, um, with God being a woman instead of a guy. But because the main character got hurt by his dad, and so he hated the Lord, hated God because of that. And so there's a scene there, you know, because again in the, in the movie the guy was beat up basically by his dad in a shack. And so in, in the movie, there's a scene where they take the man who's angry at his dad, they put him into a cave, and they said, okay, you're so angry at God, 
because of what your dad did to you. He goes, I want you to be God now, and you choose who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. So they kept showing him visions of these people that were bad and saying, he said, that person goes to hell. Okay, that person goes to hell. Oh, that person goes to hell. Well, then they show a little boy. And he's like, well, that little boy shouldn't go to hell. He's a little boy. He's innocent. And then they pan back from that and showing him getting beaten up by his father. And he said, that little boy was your father. And all of a sudden it hit him. Oh, my gosh. That's why he did to me what he did, because his dad did that to him. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. It's because whatever happened to our dad or our mom, they're hearing the voices of the enemy. They're hearing the demonic voices at that point. And then they take out their pain based upon what they're hearing on their children. And then they end up picking it up, the very same thing that they had. And that's how it passes on down to the third and the fourth generations. And then the, the dad of, of the person that gets hurt has a spirit of pride. And he'll like blame the kids. And he will not take responsibility to look in the mirror himself. And that's what needs to happen. And, and the Lord showed me, he said, part of your ministry, Nelson, is part of what Malachi 4, 5, and 6 is. Where he says, I'm sending Elijah before the great and dreadful day to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the children of the fathers. Because he said, when a person gets humble, they can look in the mirror at themselves and say, Father, forgive me. You know, I choose to forgive all those that hurt me. And then get delivered. Then they can apologize to their children and say, I am so sorry. You know, I was taking out all this stuff. I didn't know what I was doing, you know. Will you please forgive me? When you do that, then the children's hearts turn back to the parents. And instead of the parents being angry at the children, the children now love. And it takes some time to earn the trust back. But when they know you truly change, and I've seen this now thousands of times over all over the world, where we're seeing that play out now. We're seeing entire families get delivered. I'm like, it's a beautiful thing. Because then when they get together for Christmas and the holidays or whatever, they love each other. And you're just like, oh my gosh, we don't strive, we don't fight anymore. Um, so the, the, the first thing is you have to choose to forgive. And you have to mean it. And so you ask the Holy Spirit, show me, why did my dad do that? Why did my mom? Why were they so horrible? And invariably it always comes back that they were hurt by somebody. I mean, they, no one's going to hurt you if they didn't get hurt. They just won't. Hurting people hurt people. And that's how it works. So I'm like, oh, this is so good, Revelation, Lord. Oh my gosh, I can get this across to people. I can explain it. And let the Holy Spirit then speak. Well, then the second part of the deliverance is we have to get rid of the, the prideful spirit. So I'm going to read this. Um, Proverbs 6.16. Let me find it. And a lot of you have probably read this before. I mean, I read it a bunch, and I didn't really understand it, but now I do. It says, These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. So you probably know what I'm getting ready to say. A proud look is the first thing. So pride. Do we have any pride, which is what spirit Leviathan. So he hates that. He doesn't like pride. You know, who had pride in, in, in Jesus' times? The Pharisees did. You know, he knew their hearts were wicked. He looks at the heart. So we, we may be able to be out here doing a lot of good things that appear to be good in front of the church, in front of the TV cameras and so forth. But behind closed doors, we're hurting people. The Lord sees that. He wants us to get set free from that. Uh, the second thing it says is a lying tongue. So again, we lie. And that's what that spirit of Jezebel does. It causes us to say things that are not true, that can hurt our spouse, that can hurt our children, that can hurt people. Um, hands that shed innocent blood, of course, is murder. Um, a heart that divides, and that's Jezebel. A heart that devises wicked plans, that's Jezebel. Feet that are swift and running to evil, Jezebel. A false witness who speaks lies, Jezebel. And one who sows discord among brethren. So gossip and so forth that are not true or half-truths. All that stuff's Jezebel and Leviathan. So God does not like that. So then, when you go back to Revelations, because it talks about Jezebel there, Revelations 2, and a lot of people don't know this, but Revelations 2, 18 through 23, talks about, again, these seven churches that represent today's church, church in the end times. I also talked about the churches back then. But it talks about the corrupt church. It says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So again, he says that it, he knows the works. He sees what you're doing, and, and it could be really good things that you're doing in the church, that you're doing in the community, that you're doing to, to make things look good. But he said, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. And it says, because you allow... Now it says, that woman, again, Jezebel doesn't have to be a woman, but it says, that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. So a lot of people that prophesy struggle with these spirits. 
says, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds 